Do you have a dream that haunts you? I do. It began when I was an undergraduate many years ago. I dreamed of an old dusty attic, but getting to the attic was always such a struggle. When I finally got to the door, I went in to this secret place, and before me was a dusty hallway with rooms on either side. And each in the room was those rooms were packed with artifacts, things I didn't understand, and I wanted to understand. So I would start digging through those artifacts and those things in the room until I woke up. <laughs> dream after dream, I'd have this dr same dream for years, and I would be going into the same room, and I was finding more answers. <laughs> I wanted to understand why, what, what, what was this all about? Many years after the dream started, I found a new room. It was in the end of the hall. It has never been opened. When I did crack it open, it was empty. There was no air, no life, desolate. No stories, no artifacts, no past, present, or future. The room was just empty. Again, I, I wanted to understand. I was confused for years about the dream, but then I realized, I started, began to understand what the dream was about. It became my life. The attic was a metaphor for my life. I was beginning to write stories about history, things that, that were lost and hidden and were in danger of being disappearing. See, I had a really strong anxiety about my writing for the longest, and it wasn't until I was older that I began writing, and I started writing these histories of places pulling these things out of the attic of my dream, I started writing creative nonfiction narratives and writing the truest sentences I knew. If you don't save those stories that are getting lost, we might lose our community identity. So after tagging this for years, I realized that um, we have to preserve our past before progress rolls in. Atlanta is creeping up 75. I've watched it, it's suffocating. And the Atlanta Regional Commission has said that by 2050, the Atlanta, the 21 area metro Atlanta um, area will have almost 3 million people added. That brings our total to 8.6 million in the metro Atlanta area, which includes this area. That's as if Denver, Metro Denver, moved to Metro Atlanta by 2050 in the next 30 years. Progress is suffocating. The great author James Dickey used to say, progress is a terrible thing. But we can't fight it, it's gonna happen, right? But our red clay paradise has been bulldozed for wider roads. On this road we're here today, it's, the road has been is it be, being um, expanded again <laughs> for traffic to go to another town. We're building bigger schools, and of course, the fast food chains it's time to preserve our past by protecting place. It's, this is not a new thing about protecting our place. Place is kind of magical to writers in history and to historians. It's, it's almost like when you sit in a place, questions arise in narrative form. This is not new and it's not new to this area. In fact, in the 1960s, singer songwriter Joni Mitchell wrote a song called The Big Yellow Taxi, which explains this. Doesn't it, don't it always seem to go that it, we don't know what we got till it's gone? They paved paradise and put up a parking lot. I wonder what our early, early explorers and the Native Americans would think of this progress. In the 1700s, William Bartron, an explorer and naturalist, literally walked across North Georgia. And he wrote in his book, Bartram's Travels, about this enchanted land. He talked about a land that was full, teeming with rivers in this forested land that cooled this hot and sultry land. But progress demanded that, this, that those rivers be dammed. In the 20th century, early 20th century, Barto, uh, Georgia, North Georgia needed hydroelectric power that was cheap. And the way to do it was to damp, plug up our rivers and create unnatural lakes. 
And in doing that, it changes our whole biology of our, our whole, whole area. We have to stop for a minute and emphasize the power of place. We are our land. We are our rivers. We are our, our surroundings. And we are the history that embodies this place. But we, as a society, as a generation, as a people, have really done a terrible thing to our history. We've not preserved it. We've allowed history to be plowed over, drowned, and forgotten. We allow history to be crumbled into the dirt so we can write new narratives. And the truth is uprooted and cleared away. So much is already lost because we've carelessly put away our history, our, our stories and our histories, and we've hoarded, some people have hoarded history. And then we have to depend on Google searches that take us to many falsehoods. And honestly, ter- we've done a terrible job of preserving our personal history. To me, right now, the world feels rootless. The COVID pandemic, mass shootings, and other tragedies further divide us, pulling us apart, and removing our connection. But I believe we restore our connection when we can learn from the past, open our minds to a slightly different perspective, and and move toward a future that honors differences. However, unless we start honoring our place and preserving our past, um, we'll lose it, we'll lose it. And there's something special about going to these places. And so whenever I'm writing, I go to a place. So I spent a lot of time at this one particular lake to understand what was underneath. Any given day, you can go to Altoona Lake and you can see people fishing and hunt, uh, fishing and swimming and boating. But what most people don't understand is that what, is, what lies beneath. We have to stop and look at what lies beneath. If you, some days you may be fishing over 100, 150 feet over the industrial town of Etowah. See, so in 1941, when the Army Corps of Engineers had orders to dam the Etowah River, they buried in the towns of Macedonia, Abernathysville, Gladesville, and Etowah. Etowah was a pre-Civil War town that, that Mark Anthony Cooper, they call him the Iron Man of Georgia, came and developed. He was an industrialist that was very progressive in the 1840s. He brought railroad and in, in industry to this area. He was doing a very good job. He brought all the people who worked in this town of Etowa. The town was named for the river that ran through it. The town had um, iron mill, iron smelting mill, uh, iron smelters. They had um, rolling mills, flour mills. The community had a church, a, uh, uh, a school, and a a store, everything a little town needed. But, and Cooper, Cooper had it all, but he invested heavily in the Confederacy and he lost everything. And this town, Etowa, did not really survive the war. The industrial complex was gone. His house barely survived and his family cemetery remained. So in 1941, when the Army Corps of Engineers came to impound the land around the Etowah, they they were building, buying up land and knocking down houses and knocking down farms. So the Etowah, so the Cooper family wanted to preserve their past that would be soon buried under the Altoona Dam. So they fought with the Army Corps of Engineers in a nice way. And they demanded that their family graves be moved. So right now, if you go to Oak Hill Cemetery in Cartersville, you'll see a copper green plate marking the place where 11 family graves were moved in 1949, and that was the Cooper family. The Cooper family filled the room. And so you remember my empty empty room? That's the problem. We don't fill the room. We don't keep that room full. But the Cooper family is a perfect example of people that fill the room. They filled the room, and I've seen it, I have it in my possession, they know of copies of their, their documents, their pieces of paper, their artifacts. They filled the room and preserved their history and they turned around and they gave it back to, this, to our community. 
so we can have community identity. The saddest part to me of my dream was that empty room because families have ignored their history. No one asked questions or recorded the artifacts. You know, how do we fill a room? Well, maybe it's too late. Maybe it's just too, too late. Because, because now fiction writers come in and folklorists and try to fill the air with half truth. Then we get to watch TV, riddled with fake news, stories that are, are just not true. <laughs> And what is so sad is that the truth is way more interesting than their conjured accounts. So how do you fill the room? There's three ways, I believe. First of all, support local history. I'm a member of several history societies. So history societies do a great job of preserving our past, but we need to help them. We need to help them make history profitable. And what I mean by that is we need to help them by our membership, volunteerism, and donations. History needs to be open and accessible, but unless we help them, it won't be. The second way we need to fill our room is to make history um, immersive and memorable. You remember the Cooper family? If we had some kind of technology, and I think it's already here, that we could take people back to the lake, back to the place, uh, and experience that. Because people need to experience all of their senses so that they don't forget. We need to feel it, touch it, taste it, even smell it, and, and, and hear it, and, and all our senses so that we cannot forget. I think a lot of things in our past we don't understand if we actually could experience it in an immersive way. Recently, I took my four-year-old granddaughter, Josie, to a museum to see a 4D movie. We went into the planetarium and we saw in the sky, it was um, all the sights and sounds of a violent volcano. Uh, I was afraid, she's a little sensitive, and I was afraid she'd have a meltdown. So I kept saying, Josie, you ready to go, you ready to go? And she go, finally, half afraid and all excited. She says, no, Mimi, no, I wanna stay. <laughs> and there, she will never forget her day at the museum. And she, she doesn't forget it, she remembers it. I think that if we took game designers and creative people to work with scholars and scribes to recreate these, these history so that people could go somewhere and actually feel it, just like by the Coopers. Go back, uh, there's an area called the Cooper Day Use Area, Cooper Furnace Day Use Area. That's all that remains of that wall because the rest of it's under the lake. Imagine taking a Q, your phone QR code or an augmented reality gal goes putting it on and feeling like you're back there meeting the Cooper family, meeting the workers in his mill, pouring those pots and pans. And then at the end of your virtual visit, Mark Anthony Cooper offers you a glass of his homemade wine. You can almost feel it and taste it and smell it. I think that's what it's gonna take for us to understand how important preserving history is, is to have an immersive experience. And finally, <laughs> finally, tell your story. As a writer, there's so many holes in history because people just did not tell their story. The room is empty because people didn't think it was important. The story's not important. But you need to tell your story. You need to record videos, do oral histories, put it on YouTube, write a song, draw a picture, whatever it takes. Or just take your story and give it to a storyteller and let them tell it for you. Because if you go back to the attic, many of those items will be gone before long, because people can't remember. Can that happen here? It can happen where you are. But see, the problem, it all starts with you. You have to tell your story. One of my favorite authors is Maya Angelou, and she said, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. But I say, there's no greater tragedy than letting your story die with you. Thank you.